during these few minutes of silence, you can focus on something you're grateful for or someone you're remembering, especially today, or the pace of your own breath. Will you find a comfortable place in your seat and take a few easy breaths as we settle into our shared silence together? Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Spirit of life and love, God of many names and no name, source of all. We know you in the heat and in the cool of the morning. We feel you in the heartbeats of those who love us well. We know you in the protection of our shelters and in the longing for shelter. We feel you with those who struggle for justice and your sorrow at injustice. In our celebrations of living, we know you. In our longing for one another, the loving embraces, the chance encounters, the sounds of laughter that we miss, we know you. In our mourning, our grief and our fear, we know your presence too. We pray for connection and we reach for it in an isolating time. We pray for hope and we seek it out during the roller coaster of repression and rebellion. We, tr we pray for transformation for ourselves and for our country and for our world. We lean toward it with all our might. We pray for tenderness and we open our hearts to it for our wounded spirits, our ignorance, our complacency, our shame.
From those things, we pray for freedom. And for the opportunity to make the repair that is ours to make in small ways and in large ways. We pray for presence and for comfort, for the sure knowledge that in the late nights, we are not alone. We ask these things for ourselves and for those we love and for those we do not love. Amen. For the reading this morning, we will hear the words of Frederick Douglass, delivered in an address to a convention of abolitionists on July 5th, 1852. The words are read by his descendants. Okay. My name is Alexa Ann Watson, and I am the great, great, great granddaughter of Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass is my great, 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 great. I am great. the great, great, great granddaughter of Frederick Douglass. I am the great, 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 great grandchild. I've been counting on my fingers yeah. since I was like five. This is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. Fellow citizens, I shall not presume to dwell at length on the associations that cluster about this day. The simple story of it is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers were wise men, and if they did not go mad, they became restive under this treatment. With brave men, there's always a remedy for oppression. They succeeded. And today, you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you, therefore, may properly celebrate this anniversary. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent to do, with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, 
prosperity and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear. I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty and unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. Um, this speech was written almost 170 years ago, but there, I mean, this part of it is still extremely relevant, especially with today's protests. I think that when people are oppressed, they feel silenced, and if someone feels silenced, they get angry. There are certain tactics that you need to use to get people to really hear your voice, and it's not always gonna be just like a very calm discussion. I think he's mostly talking to the people who are already on his side, but believe that um, they can still try to talk this out, or that things are still justifiable. I know a lot of people at the time were saying, and people now are still saying that it's not as bad as it could be. While the 4th of July probably does not feel the same to me as it does to others, I wouldn't say that it has no meaning because it is the time when America as a country became free from another country. Um, but I would say that it's not the time in which I gained my freedom. He had a lot of hope, especially for his age. And like I'm getting to the point in my life where I'm only 20 years old, but I'm, I'm exhausted. Like I'm, I have these thoughts like, will we ever really get to this point? Or is this really something that we should actually spend our time fighting for? Somebody once said that pessimism is a tool of white oppression. And I think that's true. I think in many ways we are still um, slaves to the notion that it will never get better. But I think that there is hope, um, and I think it's important that we celebrate black joy and black life, and we remember that change is possible, change is probable, um, and that there's hope. such old 
words and yet such relevance. That was challenging to hear for whatever reason. Breathe, clench your fists and shake them out. We can confront challenge together. We can hear anger, rebuke, scorn, disappointment and critique. We can ingest what the words of the past have to say to the present, however damning they are sometimes, we can do those things together. You know, I don't know if this is all of you and it is very odd not to be able to see your faces or hear your reactions, but I will tell you that when I am very angry, I turn on the music of my adolescence very loud. Loud punk rock on a bad day soothes the soul, it helps me feel when I really wanna lean into the feeling that no one could ever understand me and I've been wronged and I, you know, when you're really sad, you wanna to listen to sad songs and cry in your car, you don't wanna be cheered up. You wanna sink in. We want our emotions to be witnessed and to be met, blessed by the music that tells us we are not on our own. I feel that way also about the prophets of the Old Testament. When I am in a rage at my country, this American empire, a country which has been at war on the back of an economic draft for almost as long as I've been alive, a country with the worst national response to COVID-19 and some of the worst pre-pandemic health outcomes in the develop, developed world, a country that puts children in cages, a country with so much wealth that even some yachts have yachts while people go hungry and sleep on the street, a country that tells my black siblings that they are disposable, a country that plays with the lives and livelihoods of my trans and queer siblings, a country that dares to legislate the reproductive choices of certain people but refuses to legislate the requirement to wear masks, to protect one another. So when I am angry, I read the prophets. I turn straight to the strong condemnation of the nations and the empires who do wrong in the eyes of God. Sometimes I need, like Frederick Douglass described, biting scorn to meet my rage. So from Amos too, the prophet Amos speaking in the voice of God, channeling the rage of God at the injustices that people inflicted upon one another. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink wine bought with fines they imposed. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets saying, you shall not prophesy. And Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to King Jeroboam of Israel. And he told him about the prophet Amos. He said, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Amaziah then sent Amos away saying, O oh, seer, go flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy of Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Amaziah the priest accused Amos of being unpatriotic, 
Don't talk like that here, he said. This is the place where the king lived, he said. It should honor the king. Go to Mexico or Canada, go back to Africa, go back to your country, he said. Criticize China or Russia or anywhere else but here. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son. I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people, Israel. Amos said, I'm not an activist or a leader. I'm not political. I just work at the CVS and mind my business. I'm just trying to live my life, but I had to say something because this is not right. And it's not right, right here. Amos the prophet, speaking in the voice of God, says, I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted am animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Does the prophet Amos mean that you personally should be ashamed for attending or longing to attend some social distance 4th of July parties? I don't think so. We need excuses to celebrate these days and we need them badly. But what exactly we are celebrating does require reflection. What exactly we are worshiping declares deserves careful consideration. Amos has harsh words for the priests of the temple who tell him to prophesy elsewhere to take his criticisms and go. Amos and Frederick Douglass both have harsh words for the churches and houses of faith that praise the state. We have made an idol of independence, of freedom. We're obsessed with the idea that what we have, we got all by ourselves. We balk at any suggestion that our personal freedoms might be curtailed for the collective good, and it is literally killing us in large numbers, worse than anywhere else in the world. And of course, our freedoms are racially coded. Heavily armed white men stormed the state house in Michigan and were repelled peacefully. Black people get shot for running, walking, driving, protesting, going to parties, lying in their own beds. What freedom and for whom? Our nation has its own religion and it is a worshiping of a bastardized freedom, a freedom unconcerned with collective health or wellness, a defensive freedom, and I got my freedom, a who are you to ask for help freedom, a who are you to say you matter freedom, a be grateful you aren't jailed for speaking like this against your government kind of freedom, a be grateful and be quiet kind of freedom and it can't get any better than this kind of freedom let us not be fooled let us not be fooled that our freedom started in 1776 any of us let us not be duped into believing that some of us are free when some of us are in bondage let us not buy the lie that our freedom comes to us from the government for people of faith, our freedom is in the higher calling, beyond love of country or love of success, love of stability, or even sometimes love of our very lives. We discover that freedom when with celebrations and drums and choirs and tearful whispers, we declare our interdependence. We know that it is in devotion to one another that we are freed from loneliness. It is in caring well for the sick and the dying that we are freed from the terror of the specter of death. It is in feeding the hungry and demanding that the bread be shared that we are freed from all kinds of starvation. 
It is in our covenant with one another and with God, with the enduring spirit at the center of things, with the astonishing power of love, that we discover the kind of freedom worth chasing, worth celebrating, and even worth dying for. Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams said it this way, I call that church free, which enters into covenant with the ground of freedom, that sustaining, judging, transforming power not made with hands. It protests against the idolatry of any human claim to absolute truth or authority. He continues, I call that church free, which liberates from bondage to the principalities and the powers of the world, whether churchly or secular, and which promotes the continuing reformation of its own and other institutions. So my friends, this Independence Day weekend, may you be troubled And may you be liberated from the idols of absolute truth or human authority. May you allow yourself to mourn the things you thought were true, the things you once believed, the things you wanted to believe, but then you looked around you and you saw what has been kept from you. Allow yourself to acknowledge the dread that lives inside you about the fate of our nation. Be liberated from the idea that freedom comes from the government. Set your sights ever on the promise of true freedom for us all. Draw courage from the love that casts out fear and the hope that never dies. May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen. And now will you rise?